right, a couple of announcements for today. Your homework six has been out since late last week. It's due exceptionally on Tuesday tonight. Um, your project four went out late last week and is due this Friday at five. Project four is a new project. Um, there will be some rough edges along the way. Keep that in mind. Um, make sure to ask questions if things aren't clear. Since everything came out pretty late, we've also changed the homework and project grading policy in that both for homework and for project, we will drop your lowest homework and we will drop your lowest project when calculating your homework grade and your project grade. So I guess if you feel like this project four came on to you too late to get it done right in the middle of midterm season, um, there's the opportunity to drop project four, but um, I highly recommend you actually do it because there will be a project five and six and the semester usually only gets busier and busier as time goes by, so you might wanna reserve your drop for later in the semester. Any questions about logistics? Yes. Um, the discussion sections this week are, as they've been recently, there is a regular discussion section which is getting up to speed on recent materials and there's an exam practice session which is the other slots which Chelsea can say what that's covering this week. Any other questions about logistics? All right, so today we're going to look at sampling. This still belongs to our set of BaseNets lectures. Um, so just as a quick reminder, what was a BaseNet? A BaseNet consisted of a directed acyclic graph with one node per random variable. For each node, there's a conditional probability table that encodes the conditional distribution of that variable given its parents in the graph. A BaseNet encodes a joint distribution, and the way you get the joint distribution is by multiplying together all of these conditionals. So for any BaseNet, you can always recover the full joint distribution just using this equation over here. This is a special case of the chain rule, right? That's how we got to this. If you start from the chain rule, you just have a product, product of conditionals of a variable given the preceding variables. In a BaseNet, instead of conditioning on all the preceding variables in the ordering, you condition just on the parents. And so often that's a smaller set, and that way you end up with a smaller way of representing a full joint distribution than using the full joint distribution itself or the original chain rule. Now, even though we start from a compact representation, that doesn't mean we necessarily can compute answers to probabilistic inference queries right away. So what we looked at then is how do we answer a query. Um, the naive way was to run inference by enumeration, which meant you go from your base net representation to a full join by joining all factors together. And then from the full joint, you can run inference by enumeration to find an answer to any query. Unfortunately, that means you're still going through the full joint, which is very expensive. A base net. Um, if you have a BaseNet, instead of going to the full joint first, you can run inference by interleaving the joining and the marginalizing. So you would pick a hidden variable, join all factors that involve that hidden variable. That gives you a new factor. The size of that factor will be d to the power k, where d is the domain size of each variable, and k is the number of variables in that factor, the number of uninstantiated variables. If you keep doing this until all hidden variables have been eliminated, you get effectively the answer to your query, maybe after also some renormalization. And so how expensive variable elimination is depends on the size of the factors you generate along the way. If your largest factor is of size k, of number of variables k, you'll have d to the k entries. If k is much smaller than the total number of hidden variables, then variable elimination will be much more efficient than inference by enumeration. We saw that in examples like this one, the order in which you eliminate variables will affect how expensive variable elimination is. For this example here, our query that we looked at was for xn while conditioning 
on all the y variables, we saw that if we first eliminate z, variable elimination is very expensive because we right away eliminate a very big factor over x1 through xn. If they're binary, you have two to the n entries in that factor, which, which could be a lot for large n. On the other hand, if you first eliminate x1, then x2, and so forth, all the way till xn minus 1, and then only eliminate z, you only, only generate small factors along the way with two hidden variables in them at most. And so this way, you can actually very efficiently compute the answer to the query, in this case, xn, given all y variables. Then we answer the question, given that sometimes an ordering can be expensive, another ordering can be cheap, is there always a cheap ordering? And the answer was no. There are base nets where even the best ordering is going to be expensive, at least if p not equals np. And here was an example of the type of base net that shows that to us. Right? Now, you can argue, well, this is a base net with only so many variables. How is it expensive? Keep in mind that this is just a canonical example. The reason we show this example is as an example of how you can represent any three sat constraint satisfaction problem as a base net inference problem and showing that if you can solve base net inference efficiently, that means you can solve any three sat problem efficiently. And the way we set this up is we said all the original variables are in the top row, then all the clauses, which are combinations of three variables, are in the next row. And then there's that tree structure at the bottom that effectively ends all the clauses together. The query we looked at is just the query PZ. Very simple query, looking at the distribution for that bottom variable. If that bottom variable has a non-zero probability of being true, that means there is a satisfying assignment to the three set problem. If that bottom variable has a zero probability of being true, then there is no satisfying assignment. And so just knowing whether it's zero or non-zero, the probability of z being true is enough to answer the three set query whether this problem is satisfiable or not. So that shows that even for a simple Bayesian inference query where there's not even any evidence, it's just a question about one variable in the Bayesian, it's going to be as hard to in general compute the answer to that as it is to solve three set problems. So in some sense, we're, we're stuck then in that we don't have a general inference procedure that's efficient. And today what we're going to look at is inference procedures that are efficient but not exact. So you will work on the trade-off of being happy to have an approximate answer to our query instead of an exact answer, but at least we can get the answer more quickly. And the approach we'll look at is sampling. So what is sampling? Sampling, you can think of a lot like simulation. Let's say you're trying to simulate what the weather will be like tomorrow. You think of a lot of variables related to the atmospheric pressures, where the clouds are, and so forth. You might simulate how they move over time and predict the weather based on that. Same for, let's say, a basketball game. You might have some kind of probability that one team scores when they go in offense, probability that the other team scores when they go in offense. Maybe you think they go each go in offense a certain number of times. You simulate, oh, maybe they score, maybe they don't score, maybe it's two, maybe three points, maybe one. And over time, you see how the score evolves until the end of the game. And at that point, you can decide which team won according to that sample run. But then that was just a sample run, just one sample. You might have to repeat this same for the weather. There will be a lot of uncertainty in what you simulate. So you might have to do multiple runs to get out what is a likely outcome. So it's effectively like simulation. Um, the basic idea is that we draw n samples from some distribution s. And so s here on the slides we're looking at will act a lot like what the letter p has been in past lectures. It stands for the sampling distribution. It's a probability distribution, S. It's not the exact one necessarily that we want to work with. It's often an approximation, but this is what we'll be working with. From these samples, once we've drawn the samples, we can compute answers to inference queries from these samples. Um, and you can show if your sampling distribution corresponds to P, which we'd have to show, then if you draw enough samples, you'll your answer to your query will converge to the correct answer. So you have 
essentially an anytime algorithm here where as you spend more time, your answer will become more and more accurate. Why would you sample? There are two reasons we'll encounter samples in this class. In today's lecture, it'll be all about inference. What I mean with that is it'll be about answering probabilistic inference queries in an approximate way. In future lectures, we'll see situations where we actually don't sample ourselves, but somebody just provides us with samples from a distribution, and we'll use those samples to then learn what the underlying distribution might have been. All right, so on this slide, we'll do sampling for a given joint distribution. And so in principle, this solves all our problems because once we know how to sample from a joint distribution, we can make it, when we start from a base net, we can make it into a joint distribution, sample from it. But of course, the whole idea of running inference efficiently is that you avoid that. But it'll still be a starting point. So let's say you want to sample from a given distribution. No base net involved here yet. Step one, you get a sample, U, from the uniform distribution over the interval zero to one. So this is effectively a real number between zero and one that you sample. Pretty much any programming environment that you work in will provide that call to you. It's actually a whole complicated field to do this well and to make sure that you actually get a good set of samples and so forth. That's something you might cover in a theory class. For today's lecture, we just assume that somebody resolved that for you and you have a good call to a random number generator that generates numbers uniformly at random between zero and one. So that's our starting point here. That's a given. Once we have that sample, we're gonna convert it into a sample from the distribution we really want to sample from, okay? The way we do that, well, let's look at an example. Let's say here's our distribution we really want to sample from. We'll first sample a number between zero and one, and then we'll actually split up the zero one interval according to the weights we see over here, these probabilities. We'll say from 0 to 0 0.6 is red, 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 is green, and then 0 0.7 to 1 is blue. Note that this is kind of arbitrary. You could reorder these variables, and the outcome of your sampling would be different in many, many cases. That's fine. Sampling is random. You can't really have a fixed outcome per se. And so here, you could even split the interval differently. You, if you wanted to split it 0 0.2, 0 to 0 0.3 red, and then 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 green, and then 0 0.4 to 0 0.7 red again, that's all good. As long as the fraction of the 0 to 1 interval that's red is 0 0.6, the fraction that's green is 0 0.1, and the fraction that's blue is 0 0.3. So now we can sample from any discrete joint distribution over any set of variables. First sample between 0 and 1, and then just partition that interval according to the probabilities of each of the possible outcomes. Okay, so if we got back u equals 0 0.83, using this procedure here, we'd say our sample is blue. Any questions about this procedure? All right, so we now know how to sample from a joint distribution. Maybe we sample multiple times, usually that's necessary to get a good representation. And we get something like this, five times red, two times blue, one time green. Note that if you now compute from these samples the probability, your estimate for the probability for red from these samples would be equal to, there are five reds out of eight, so it'd be five over eight, which is actually not equal to 0 0.6. That's just the way this works. You're almost never going to get the exact answer. You're going to get something that's hopefully approximately what you want. Same for blue. If you want to estimate the probability for blue based on this, you would end up with two over eight, which is one out of four, which is, again, not exactly equal to 0 0.3. It's just an approximation that we obtained from eight samples. Had we sampled a million times, our estimates would probably be very, very close to 0 0.6, 0 0.1, and 0 0.3. All right, so now we know how to sample from a joint distribution. Now we're going to look at how to sample in base nets, where at the core of our sampling procedures, we'll use what we just saw on the previous slides. And this is going to be a progression. So effectively, we're going to work our way through, top to bottom, 
And the first one, prior sampling, will be the most naive way to do sampling. And then we'll start improving as we work our way through lecture till we end up with the most sophisticated way of sampling that we cover, which is Gibbs sampling. So prior sampling. Let's look at a base net. Here's our base net. And let's look at how we could generate samples from this base net without building the full joint distribution. Okay, one way to do this is to think back of this kind of sampling as like simulation, especially when you do it in base net, it becomes very, very similar. You say, well, what's, what process is encoded here? Could be cloudy or not, then the sprinkler could be on or not based on that, there could be rain or not based on that, and then there could be wet grass or not based on whether the sprinkler is on and whether it's raining or not. So in some sense, you could think of this as a process that runs from the top in the base net down to the bottom. And we could actually start sampling at the top. We could say, well, as a first step, let's sample from the distribution for cloudy. And we have the distribution right here. We would sample this number u between 0 and 1, translate that into plus c or negative c. So that's our first distribution we sample from. We know how to do that. Let's say we got plus c. Then we can move on to the next variable. Let's say sprinkler is our next variable. Here is the distribution for sprinkler given plus c, because the parent variable cloudy has been instantiated in our sampling procedure to be plus c. So we just look at the highlighted part of that conditional distribution. Now we can sample from this distribution using the same procedure we used on two slides ago. In this case, maybe it comes out as negative s. And we move on to our next variable, rain has one parent, cloudy, so we instantiate, the parent's already instantiated, so we pick that part of the distribution. Now we just sample from that distribution, just the same way we've been doing in all previous cases here. Um, maybe it came out plus r. We move on to our last variable, wet grass. We look at the parent variables, look at how they're instantiated, subselect that part of the conditional distribution table, and then sample the instantiation of wet grass. In this case, it came out plus w. Note that the way this works is we go top down, and the reason we go top down in this base net is because to be able to sample a variable, you need to know the values of the parents of that variable. And so you need to go in an ordering that's consistent with the ordering in the graph. Of course, if your graph is drawn in a different way, running left to right, you might sample left to right, but the ordering of the variables in the graph matters as you decide on your sampling variable that's coming next. So in this case, we'd always start with cloudy, then we could choose sample sprinkler next or rain, then the other one, and then the last variable to sample would always be wet grass. So that's our first sample. Of course, that's just one sample. If you just use one sample to estimate the answer to a query, then you get very simple answers, right? If you just look at this, what's the probability of wet grass? You'd say it's probability one, because my only sample says that it's plus W. Um, of course, we need to repeat this procedure. And as you build up more and more samples, you might be able to compute more accurate answers to your queries. So procedurally, what this looks like is something like this. You, for, to generate one sample, you cycle through all your variables in some ordering that's consistent with the ordering of the variables in the graph. You sample xi from the conditional of xi given the parents of xi, which you already sampled before, and then you return that full instantiation x1 through xn that's your one sample. Okay. Now we need to consider whether this generates samples that we are happy with. What we'll do for that is we look at the sampling distribution. What distribution are we generating these samples from? Okay. So our sample distribution, S, according to the sampling procedure, PS, which stands for prior sampling, is this distribution over here. Why is that? When we sample xi, we draw it from this particular distribution. When we sample the next one, we draw it from similarly the same distribution. The joint probability of getting a particular sequence of x1, x2 through xn is the product of the probabilities of each of these samples as they're being generated. This is actually the probability distribution encoded by the base net. So we are getting samples from the correct distribution. 
So that's a good thing. So this is a, what this means is that we have a procedure that in the limit will tell us the right answer to our queries. More specifically, if we're answering a query, what we'll do is we'll look at the total number of samples that we generated. And then we'll say, well, in the limit, sorry, let me rephrase that. Let's look at the number of samples we generate for a particular event being true. And we'll look at the limit of number of samples going to infinity, the number of samples for which the event is true, divided by the total number of samples in the limit will be equal to the probability of that event under our sampling distribution, which in turn is the correct base net distribution. So we actually get the correct answer if we sample long enough for n going to infinity. Um, there are more precise answers there in that as n gets larger and larger, you are getting closer and closer and closer with very high probability. This property here is called consistency. So if somebody asks you, is your sampling procedure consistent? That question corresponds to this thing over here. In the limit, as I get infinitely many samples, will I get the correct answer to my query? All right, so prior sampling is good in that it's a consistent procedure. But as we'll see, it's still a little naive in terms of how efficient it is in getting answers to queries. Okay, so let's look at an example. Let's say we ran prior sampling and we got this set of samples here. So if we want to now know the probability of W, we can look at those samples and see that four times we have plus W, one time we have negative W, from that we compute our estimated probability for plus W and negative W to be 0 0.8 and 0 0.2. From the previous slide, we know our procedure is consistent. We know if we kept sampling more and more and more, this will get closer and closer and closer to the actual answer. We can estimate anything else too. This was just one thing. You might estimate what's the conditional distribution for C given plus W. How would you do that? You would look at just the samples where there is plus W, just these four. And you check how often there is plus C. It's plus C here. So three out of four times when it's plus W, is there a plus C? So here you'd have something of the form C, P, C, given plus W as your estimate. For plus C, you'd have three out of four, negative C, one out of four. And that'd be your estimated distribution for this particular query. How about C given plus R and plus W? Now I just look at wherever plus R and plus W are true, which is here, here, and here. C is always true in this case. So we have a distribution where we estimate the probability of plus C is equal to one whenever we have plus R and plus W, at least based on this set of samples. How about this one here? Distribution for C given negative R and negative W. Any thoughts? <coughs> Over here. So the answer is correct. I'll just state it again so everybody can hear it. The answer was, this is not defined based on this set of samples. So if we ask you at any point, based on such a set of samples, what is that probability? You just say cannot answer based on the samples provided, right? Because um, negative R, negative W never appears in here in a single sample together. All right. So if you want a very fast answer to your query, you just sample only a few samples, but your answer might not be that as accurate as you'd like. If you want a very accurate answer, you keep sampling longer and longer, longer the, the more accurate an answer you want. Okay, the main thing we want to keep in mind to move on to the next step is how we computed the answers to the probabilistic inference queries from these samples. So we generated this set of samples here and then we looked at how to answer these queries. Right. And whenever we try to answer a query, one thing that happened is, if we're interested in the query for C given plus R plus W, 
the only samples that matter are the samples where we have plus r and plus w. Other samples don't contribute to how we answer this query. So in some sense, those other samples were useless if we knew this was going to be our query. And that insight is what we're going to leverage in the next sampling procedure where we're going to avoid doing spurious competition and sample things that are not going to help us answer the query we have. So that's called rejection sampling. So let's look at that again in detail here. Let's say we want a distribution as a first optimization to what we've been doing. Let's say we're interested in distribution for C. And let's say we sample all of these. But when we compute the answer to the query, all we do is check how often we have plus C or negative C. And we actually know that C was sampled first and all the work we did sampling S, R, and W was actually not necessary. We could have skipped that. We could have just sampled C at the top here and not continue with the other variables. So that's a simple optimization we can do to make our procedure more efficient. Of course, if really your variable is the top variable in the base net, you can just read off the distribution. But in general, this applies if there are variables further down in the base net that don't show up in your query, you don't need to go sample those. You can just ignore them. Next optimization we can do, if we're interested in C given plus S, the only samples that matter are the ones where we have plus S. So it'd be this one here, this one here. The other samples don't contribute to how we compute the answer to that query. So what we could do is after we sample S, and if it comes out negative, we could say, let's not worry about sampling R and W. This sample is useless anyway. Let's just move on and restart at the top of the base net and generate a new sample that hopefully will come out right in the sense that we'll hopefully get plus S this next time around. So you would effectively, when you sample with rejection sampling for this particular query, you would work through going this way. You'd sample plus C, negative S. At that point, you'd say, I'm stopping the generation of this sample. I'm not bothering sampling those. I'm right away, moving on to the next sample. You go plus C, plus S. That's the right one. So you keep going, plus R, plus W. Then generate the next sample. Also, this one here is actually a, a completely useless sample for your query. Move on to the next one, negative C. Plus S, that's correct. You keep going, plus R, negative W, and so forth. You would not do this piece of the work, this piece of the work, this piece of the work, this piece of the work. And this would be your valid samples that you'd actually be working with. OK, so what does that look like algorithmically? You sample still Xi from the conditional given its parents, but if xi is an evidence variable, meaning that you know what value it's supposed to have in your query, and you get an outcome that's not consistent with the evidence in your query, you know that this sample is not going to be useful, and you just cut it off and right away restart and generate a next sample. All right, so at least we're not wasting time when we have an evidence variable coming out sampled inconsistent with the actual evidence. But it's actually still a bit problematic here because what's happening now is that you might spend a lot of time sampling variable one, two, three, all the way down. You might hit the bottom of your base net and that very last variable you're sampling comes out not consistent with the evidence. And now you still did all the work and just at the very end you realized, okay, sorry, this sample is useless. Let's restart. So in likely waiting, well, I should find a fix for this. So the problem we just looked at with rejection sampling and solved was doing extra work once we get the wrong sample, but we still can end up with the wrong sample. So if evidence is unlikely, this will actually happen a lot. So if you have some evidence that's not super likely, then somehow once you sample it, you rarely will get what you actually saw. You might say, well, is that a problem? Well, think about it this way. Let's say you have maybe um, k evidence variables. And for those k evidence variables, actually, it's maybe 50-50, the chance they come out positive or negative. Then you say, well, 
then I have a reasonable chance for each one of them to get the right outcome when I sample. But to get the right outcome for all k of them, that's a probability of 1 over 2 to the k. And so once you have a bunch of evidence variables, the probability that each of your evidence variables comes out the right way will go down very rapidly as your number of evidence variables grows. And so if you have, let's say, 1,000 evidence variables, it'll take an impractical number of runs before you finally get your samples to be consistent with your evidence, or just even one sample consistent with your evidence. Okay? So let's look at a simple distribution here. We're interested in the query. What's the probability distribution for shape? Given that we know the color of the shape that we produced is blue. Rejection sampling will just generate samples, and then every now and then it'll happen to be blue, and that sample is useful. In likelihood weighting, we actually fix the evidence variables and only sample the other variables. So this is very different from what we've done so far. So what happens is our distribution will be not consistent anymore because we're not sampling from the correct distribution anymore because we're fixing some variables. As we encounter them, we just fix them to whatever the evidence values are. Um, the solution to that, we can now start weighting the samples and we'll see that that's the right thing to do. Pictorially, what it looks like is something like this. You first sample shape, and then no matter what you sampled for shape, color will be blue. So you'll get a set of samples that looks like this. Now, of course, these are not the right samples, and in addition to having the sample, we will have a weight, and there will be a weight here for the first one, probability of blue given pyramid, for the next one, will also be a weight, probability of blue given pyramid. For this one here, the probability um, blue given sphere. This one will be probability blue given cube. And this last one will be probability blue given sphere. And so we now have a set of weighted samples rather than just unweighted samples as we had before. And this weighting here is accounting for the fact that we're somehow cheating in the sampling procedure. We're now following the prescribed distribution. We're fixing it to be blue. And so when blue was very likely, that is the probability, let's say, blue given pyramid might be high, then that sample will have a high weight because it was a reasonably okay thing to do. And if blue was very unlikely, maybe blue is very unlikely when you have a cube, then probability of blue given cube will be very low, and that sample will have a very low weight to account for that. Yes? Okay, so the question is, what if we have multiple evidence variables, right? What, what will this weight look like? And let's say we had another one here, maybe, what can we, uh, maybe some kind of quality of the shape we produced. And we might inspect it, it might be like a high or a low quality or something, right? So another variable here, maybe we observed it's low quality and it's blue, and we want to know what the distribution is over shape, right? then what would happen is, as a third step, you'd, you'd be encountering the quality variable. In rejection sampling, you'd just sample it based on the instantiation of the parent. But in likelihood weighting, you'd fix it because it's an evidence variable. Let's say it's high, high quality. You fix it to be high. Then you would add high in the back here as your instantiation. And then you'd multiply in the probability of high quality given its parent, which in this case, shape equals pyramid. And so you'd multiply all of these together to get a single weight still for each sample. Question there. So what do you get the probabilities from? Good question. So the assumption we make in this lecture is that the probabilities are given to us, that we're given a base net where for each variable in the base net, we have a conditional distribution of that variable given its parents. In practice, it can be difficult to decide what these probabilities should be. And once we get to machine learning, which is three lectures from now, we'll see how we can also learn those probabilities from data. But for now, we assume that they're given at this point and we work with them. Not a question there. That's it. That's a great point. So it is possible that when you have a pyramid, probability of blue given pyramid is zero, and then the weight of that sample will be zero, 
And the way we compute inference answers from our samples is by essentially doing weighted sums, and the contribution there will be then zero from that sample. Um, following up on that, though, that means that sample becomes useless, right? And you kind of are still in the same situation as in rejection sampling that you sampled pyramid, and then later it was shown to be useless because you could never get blue. And so the more kind of gradual aspect of what you're getting at is that if your weights are low, your samples are not as useful than if your weights are high. And that's still a deficiency of likelihood weighting that we'll address in the next procedure. But so likelihood weighting is good in that you can use all your samples. But keep in mind that the higher the weight, the more useful the sample. And so if you generate a lot of low weight samples, you might still get only very approximate answers to your queries. It was not a question somewhere there. Yes? Okay, so the reason, so the reason we, mul we have a weight for each sample in likelihood weighting is that ideally we want our samples to be representative of the true underlying distribution. To get that, we can run prior sampling or rejection sampling. We'll get samples that are representative of the true underlying distribution. But in likelihood weighting, we're not sampling from the true underlying distribution. When we are encountering an evidence variable, we decide not to sample it and forego sampling from the true underlying distribution for that variable given its parents. Since we forego that and we fix it to the evidence values, we're actually sampling from the wrong distribution. And we need to now compensate for that. And the way we compensate for that is by bringing in this weighting of the samples. What we missed when fixing the value to blue, we missed the distribution of color given shape. And the way we compensate for having missed that in generating our sample is by weighting our sample using that distribution. In this case, the entry of the distribution that matters is glue, blue given pyramid. We'll see a little more formally on the next slide. There's a question here. So let's say there is another edge here, right? Okay, what happens now is the first two steps will be the same, nothing changed there. Then the third variable we will sample, quote unquote, it's an evidence variable, so we don't really sample it, it's fixed, we'll fix it. The weight that we'll use for that then will be instead of what we had here, we'll use a weight, um, in this case, the distribution of whatever the quality instantiation was, let's say high, given shape, which was pyramid, and color, which was blue. And so what we multiply in now will be this quantity here. So always what we multiply in will be the probability of the evidence variable given its parents. Some of its parents will have been sampled. Some of its parents will have been fixed to whatever they were fixed to. But either way, what we multiply in will be the conditional given its parents. All right, so let's look at this in action on our running example business. So we have a query that involves evidence at sprinkler being plus S, wet grass being plus W. We run likelihood weighting. We start at the top of the base net. That's a unobserved variable, so we sample it as we've done so far in all sampling procedures. Games that come out, comes out plus C. Move on to the next variable, which is Sprinkler, which is observed as plus S. So we have to update, in this case, the weight, because we're going to fix this. We look at what's plus S given plus C. It's this entry over here. We multiply that in with the weight, the running weight that we're tallying up here. Then we move on to rain. Rain is unobserved, so we actually sample it based on whatever its parent values are, in this case, plus C. We sample, happens to come out as plus R, 
the weight doesn't change here because we sampled. Then we, we move on to wet grass. Wet grass is fixed. Um, we look at the conditional distribution given its parent instantiations. And then we say it's plus W, so we need to look at this entry over here and multiply that into the weight. And so we have a weight of 0 0.099 for this particular sample. And then we repeat this to get more samples. So the full procedure spelled out is something like this. You start with a weight that's equal to one. You cycle through all your variables. If it's an evidence variable, you just instantiate it to whatever the evidence value is. And then you multiply the weight by the probability of that instantiation given the parents of that variable as instantiated in the current running sample. If it's not an evidence variable, you just sample it from the conditional given its parents. And then when you're done cycling through all variables, you return the instantiation as well as the weight associated with that instantiation. Okay, so the sampling distribution when we do likelihood weighting, the sampling distribution is this distribution over here. The probability of generating a sample, that would be, let's say, Z1 through ZL, as well as E1 through EK. E1 through EK are fixed. You just set them, whatever they were. Whenever you encounter a Z variable, which is an unobserved variable, you sample it from the conditional given its parents. And so the probability of generating a specific sample that looks like this only depends on the product of the conditionals of the Z variables given their parents. And the other conditional distributions are ignored in terms of generating the sample. Now to compensate for that, the samples have weights. The weight is computed based on all the conditional distributions we ignored. So that's the probability of each of the evidence variables. I guess it's M. Each of the evidence variables given their parents Multiplying both of these together would give us essentially the, the, something that corresponds to the full joint distribution. And you can prove that if you indeed then use weighted samples, because when you multiply together the way you compute weights and what you sample from corresponds to the full joint distribution, if you use these weighted samples, you are using a consistent procedure to get estimates of your probabilities. Any questions about this part? Then let's take a short break here, and after the break we'll get to the next procedure which improves on likelihood weighting. All right, let's restart. Um, any questions about what we've covered so far in lecture? Yes? Correct. Okay, so let's look at this last equation here. So the assumption is that we have a query and E1 through EM are the evidence variables that are instantiated. Then Z1 through ZL are the other variables. Some of them could be query variables, some of them could be hidden variables. What we show on this slide is that, or explain on this slide, is that when we sample according to the likelihood weighting procedure, the probability of generating a particular sample that has these values here is only influenced by the conditional of the Z variables given their parents because that's the only time when we actually sample because the E variables are fixed to whatever they are so the only thing that influences the probability of getting this sample is the condition of ZI given its parents for all ZI. We then also give weights to the samples to compensate for the probability distributions that are ignored during the sampling procedure. And so what this here is saying, saying that for a given specific sample, Z1 through Z, ZL, E1 through EM, the probability of generating that sample times the weight we associate with that sample is equal to 
this expression over here, which we get from the first equation, times this expression over here, which we get from the second equation. And what the last step is doing is saying that's actually equal to the probability of the full instantiation E1 through EM, C1 through ZL, according to the original distribution. So what this is expressing is that, well, if we use our samples, but we use them weighted by the weights that we compute here, then we are using a set of weighted samples that's coming from the right distribution. Actually, I haven't said here what it means to use a weighted set of samples, but let's say you had um, a sample, maybe plus Z plus E with a weight of 0 0.1, and then maybe negative Z plus E with a weight of 0 0.2, then the probability of the distribution that you get from this would have entries 0 0.1, over, well, it's not sticking. Distribution you would have based on this would be a probability of one third for plus z given plus e and a probability of two thirds of negative z given plus e, where you use these weights to do the counting in a weighted way. Any other questions about this slide or the earlier parts? Yes. Once you multiply by the weights, is that the same as? I guess like you did the, um, like the SWS thing, like, of, like the exact, but you get the actual probability of, is that, is that what the algorithm is for? If you use your samples in a weighted way, yeah. then if you generate enough samples, you will get ultimately the correct estimate of any, dis any probability from that you might want to compute for that distribution with that particular evidence. This thing over here? Okay, so what this is saying, just to kind of read out what, what that expression is saying, it's saying the probability of ending up with a sample Z1 through ZL taking on some particular values and E1 through EM being whatever the evidence was that was fixed. That's how to read the left-hand side and then it says that's equal to the expression on the right-hand side, which computes it. So in some sense, you can say, well, yeah, it's given a specific set of evidence. This is the probability you generate that specific Z sample, but it's actually, it's not the conditional of Z given evidence because that's, that's something more complicated, actually. So that's why, we, I mean, we don't put a conditioning bar here just because it's actually not computing a conditional probability in the sense that you might actually want. It's just saying, what's the probability of this instantiation being generated? Okay, so is that the multiplication there is over all the parents? This multiplication here is over all these Zs. So this is a product over Z1, probability of Z1 given its parents times probability of Z2 given its parents times probability of Z3 given its parents and so forth. The way we define a notation here is that you start with a set of variables that could have any names and then you rename them. The ones that are instantiated you call E1 through EM. The ones that are not instantiated, you call Z1 through ZL. And the Z variables are the ones that you sample. And the E variables are the ones that you just keep fixed as they are. It doesn't depend whether they're last or first, it just depends whether they're evidence or not. Now in terms of this expression over here, this will only come up in this expression here if you're sampling a variable ZI, and the one that you're sampling is the one sitting up front step i, so to say, you're sampling zi. Now the ones in the back here, the parents of zi, 
Some of these parents could be evidence variables. Some of these parents could be Z variables. It doesn't matter. They came before ZI in the sampling procedure, so by the time you get to ZI, they will be fixed, either because they're evidence or because they have been sampled before ZI. So at this point, those will all be fixed. Okay, yeah, so let's say you have a set of weighted samples. Let's find a spot where we can write a few samples. Let's say we had maybe plus Z1, plus Z2, plus, plus E with a weight of 0 0.2. Maybe we have plus Z1, negative Z2, plus E with a weight of 0 0.1, maybe we have negative Z1 plus Z2 plus E with a weight of 0 0.4, maybe we have another plus Z1 plus Z2 plus E, same sample as we had earlier on, it will of course then have the same weight, 0 0.2. Let's say those are our four samples, and let's say we now are interested in the probability of plus Z1 given plus E, then we would look at all of these samples and we tally up the weights for when it's plus Z1 versus when it's negative Z1, right? So this would be equal to wherever we have plus Z1, which is the first two and the last one, so it'd be <coughs> 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2, and then we divide that by the, in this case, the total weight of all the samples, which is 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.4 plus 0 0.2. And so, whereas originally when we had sampling procedures where we didn't weight things, we just have counted how often do we have plus Z, plus Z1, and divided by the total number of samples. Now we tally the sum of the weights where we have plus Z1 and divided by the sum of all the weights of all the samples. So it's still effectively the same procedure. You, you count how often a sample occurs and divided, uh, a specific association occurs, divided by the number of samples, but now everything is weighted as you count things. All right, so that's likelihood weighting. Any thoughts on what the weaknesses of likelihood weighting might be? What kind of situation would it maybe not work so well? And you would need a lot, a lot, a lot of samples before you might get any reasonable answer out. Over there? So when we think of likelihood weighting compared to regular sampling, regular sampling, the number of samples tells us something about how accurate our estimate will be. In likelihood weighting, the sum of all the weights of our samples tells us something about how accurate our estimate is going to be. And so if we generate samples that all have very low weight, we can think of this as a, the sum of the weights as an effective sample count. So the effective value of the first sample is 0 0.2. The effective value of the next sample is 0 0.1. You can tally that up. And the effective sample count here is, in this case, 0 0.9, right? So now the question then becomes, are there situations where your weights might be inclined to be particularly low? Because that would be the situations where likelihood weighting will do quite poorly compared to um, Maybe something else. You have a thought here? So this, this is uh, exactly the right intuition here. Why, why would your samples become unrepresentative, right? An under, a low weight sample is one that's in some sense unrepresentative of the distribution you care about. That's why it's getting a low weight, right? 
somehow you sampled some things and then you encountered an evidence variable and you had to fix it to let's say blue but it was super unlikely and so your sample is not that representative and doesn't contribute much to really your final estimate right and so the question is when does this occur well if it happens to be the case in the extreme case that your evidence variables are all the way at the top and they don't have any parents then you can't have done anything wrong before you fix them. You can't have sampled things in a way that is actually unrepresentative of how the evidence came out. And so evidence that's early on works well with likelihood weighting because you haven't sampled wrong, so to say, before you encounter it. And once you instantiate it, everything that comes after it is influenced by it. So any later variables you sample are directly influenced by the evidence you already have. On the other hand, evidence that's sitting all the way at the bottom, as you're sampling, any variable you sample is not influenced by the value of that evidence. Even though maybe when it's something is blue, it says a lot about these other variables, as you're sampling, you're completely ignoring it because it's sitting all the way at the bottom, you haven't looked at it yet. And so that's the problem with likelihood weighting, is that your evidence only gets incorporated for variables that come after it, not for variables that come before it. And so if there's a lot of variables coming before your evidence, you might get a lot of unrepresentative samples and might need to sample a really long time. Okay, so it doesn't solve all our problems exactly because of this reason. What we're now going to look at is a procedure called Gibbs sampling that accounts for all evidence anytime it generates a sample, rather than just accounting for the earlier variables that are evidence. So one way to think of it is that now we're actually we're going to do something quite different in that we're not going to pass through the base net, so to say, top down, and that will give us a sample. We'll actually keep iterating over all variables in the base net and keep adjusting them until we finally find something that we will call a sample. A little bit like when we were solving constraint satisfaction problems, the initial procedures we looked at started with an empty instantiation. We worked our way down until we had something. And then we switched to something called local search, where we started with a full instantiation, but we're unhappy with it and found a way to fix it. Same thing's going to happen here, the same transition from going from empty to full to now just start with a full instantiation and try to fix it for it to become a good sample. Okay, so the procedure is that you keep track of a full instantiation x1 through xn at all times. You start with an arbitrary instantiation that is consistent with the evidence. And then you iterate. You sample one variable at a time, conditioned on the values of all the other variables. So you assume that all but one variable is fixed, and you resample one of them, conditioned on what the other var variables are right now. You only resample unobserved variables. You never resample an evidence variable because that one needs to stay fixed. You keep repeating this for a long time. Property of this procedure is that in the limit, if you do this infinitely many times, the resulting sample will be coming from the correct distribution under some technical assumptions um, that we won't get into. But for a reasonably behaved base net, this will result in a sample from the correct distribution. The rationale for this is that we're in, for this procedure is that we now, whenever we draw a variable, we're conditioning on all other variables, so we're conditioning on all evidence, as well as what the other variables happen to be right now. In contrast, likelihood weighting will only condition on upstream evidence. What upstream evidence means is evidence that is earlier in the ordering that the graph specifies. And sometimes the weights in likelihood weighting can accordingly be very small, since the sum of the weights over all samples is indicative of how many effective samples were obtained that's a problem when we run, like, run likelihood weighting. In Gibbs sampling, we resolve this by conditioning on all other variables at all times. So let's take a look at an example. Let's say we want to answer a query, S given plus R. Step one, we fix the evidence, okay? R equals plus R, so that's what our business looks like now. Step two, we need to somehow initialize all other variables randomly. So we fill something in. Um, here's an instantiation. This is not a sample yet. This is just part of our procedure. At the end of our procedure, we'll actually get out a sample. 
And then we iterate. We pick a variable that's not an evidence variable, uninstantiate it, and then sample that variable given the values of all the other variables. So we sample now from s given plus c plus r and negative w. Okay. So sample from that, get a in new instantiation of all variables, then we repeat. We say, well, let's pick a non-evidence variable. Let's uninstantiate it. In this case, we picked C. And then let's sample from the distribution of C given plus S plus R negative W. And then we again, have to instantiate it, we repeat. We uninstantiate one of the non-evidence variables, sample from the conditional given the other variables, and keep going. What's important here is actually we keep going for a long time. You don't just uninstantiate a variable once and then sample it. Each variable will go through this procedure many, many, many times before we call it done. To be guaranteed to get a sample from the correct distribution, which is a distribution conditioned on plus r, you need to go infinitely long. In practice, you get a sample from a distribution that's reasonably close to the one you want after you go somewhat long. Okay, so. Then the question becomes, how do we resample one variable given all the other variables? Because that's the core step now. If we can do that efficiently, then we can run GIP sampling efficiently. Okay, let's spell out the math here. So we're interested in the conditional of S given all the other variables. We can write this out using the definition of conditional probability. Then the bottom thing doesn't show up in the base net because the base net only specifies what the full joint looks like. So we fill in a summation over S at the bottom there. So now both top and bottom consider full joint instantiations. For full joint instantiations, we know from how a base net distribution is defined, how we can fill that in as a product of conditionals, right? Now for this product of conditionals, we can, we have a, Summation here over S, which you can actually move over here. Gives us this expression here. And now let's look at what we can simplify. There is a P plus C, P plus C that cancel out. Um, anything else that cancels out? Let's see. We have plus R given plus C and plus R given plus C. Those cancel out. And we're left with this expression over here. So what we see here is that we have an expression for the conditional of S given plus C plus R negative W. What it involves is only the conditional distributions from the original base net that involve the variable S. It involves the conditional distribution of S given C and the conditional of W given S and R. This is a small example, but these are actually general properties that when you work this out, the only conditional distributions that will remain will be the ones that involve the variable you're resampling, wherever it's a, the child or the parent in a conditional distribution. So even if you have a huge base net, if a variable only has a small number of connections, then only a small number of distributions will participate in the calculation we do over here. Okay? So many things to cancel out, essentially everything that doesn't involve S cancels out, right? So what that means is that even in a huge base net with thousands of variables, maybe millions of variables, to do one GIP sampling step, as long as there is a small number of edges into or out of a variable S, you can do the resampling of S very efficiently. All right, so what's our sampling summary? We've seen prior sampling. The idea there was that you essentially worked your way through the base net top down. There is no evidence that's known at the time. You just sample from the original base net distribution. And then you can use those samples to answer whatever query you'd like to answer. Now we also saw that then many samples, once you know what the query is, many samples will be useless to computing the answer to that query. So if we do know the query, and in particular if we do know the evidence variables, that will be instantiated and what values they will be, we can do better. We can reject samples once we are sampled something inconsistent with the evidence. We can do even more. Rather than just rejecting samples inconsistent with the evidence, we can force the evidence 
to be consistent with what it's supposed to be and not sample those variables. And to account for that, we'll reweight samples by the product of the evidence variables given their parents. The remaining issue there was that when we li do likelihood weighting, the probability of an evidence variable given its parents could be low. If we multiply them all together, we could have a low weight for a sample, which means the effective sample size doesn't go up by a whole lot. And so we need a lot of samples still. And so the problem is that we're not accounting for the evidence unless it's upstream from our current variable. Our fix to that is GIP sampling. GIP sampling looks at all variables when you generate a sampling sensation for a single variable. Now, to look at all variables, of course, you need to instantiate them all to start out with. And you'll have to then cycle through all variables multiple times to get to an actual good sample. Um, there's some advanced literature on this that you might want to check out at some point. It's beyond the scope of 188. But if you resample infinitely often in GIP sampling, you get a sample from the correct distribution. It's such a special case of something called Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And GIP sampling is a special case of Metropolis Hastings uh, algorithm. And if anybody ever tells you they're using Monte Carlo methods, that just means sampling. If they're using Metropolis Hastings, they might use GIP sampling or a different version of Metropolis Hastings. Um, once we look at Markov models, which is two lectures from now, we'll be actually be able to get some more intuition as to why we ultimately, when we keep repeating that procedure, sample from the right distribution. Procedurally, the main thing to keep in mind for now is that if you run GIP sampling, in principle, you need to go infinitely long. Then you have one sample. Then you start again. You initialize your base net variables to be initialized to some random instantiation with the evidence fixed. And then you do a new run of GIP sampling, infinitely long. You get your sample, keep repeating this. Right? So it's somewhat expensive to do it exactly. But in practice, really what it depends on is, um, in many cases, how non-deterministic your distribution is. If you have a very deterministic set of conditional distributions in your base net, GIP sampling will often have a hard time converging to a good sample. Whereas if there's a lot of stochasticity, so to say, in how these distributions are set up, it'll more quickly mix and find the right sample, so to say. All right, that's it for today.